Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our HOP Summer Research Seminar Series. If it's your first time joining us, my name is Vicki Bowden, and I'm a project manager here in HOP. We welcome you to today's seminar session. A couple of announcements before we begin. The first, um, we've enabled our Q&A feature, um, and we ask throughout the seminar if there are questions that you have that you submit them there as well. And um, we also will be sending everyone an attendee survey, um, which will help us gain feedback on today's session and also to help us gauge how your experience has been overall and how we can improve. If you've missed past record um, seminars, the recordings are available on our HOP Summer Student Program YouTube page, and we welcome you all to visit. And for today's um, seminar session, we welcome Dr. Dimitri Zamarin, and he'll be speaking on viruses and cancer. Dr. Zamarin is a medical oncologist specializing in the care of women with gynec collagic um, cancers, including cervical, ovarian, and endometrial cancers. His clinical and laboratory research is focused on the development of novel ways to use the immune system to treat cancer. And he is involved in clinical trials evaluating novel immunotherapy drugs in patients with cancer. In addition, he has a special interest in genetically engineered oncolytic viruses, an emerging class of immune therapeutic drugs that have shown significant clinical promise in the recent years. By manipulating the oncolytic viruses and the immune system, he's exploring different ways to enhance the immune recognition of tumors and to develop novel treatment strategies that would be applicable to different cancer types. Again, we'd like to welcome Dr. Samarin. Well, thank you very much for the, for, for the kind invitation. So, um, so, uh, uh, um, and, and thank you everybody who is, uh, who is attending the, uh, the talk and hopefully we'll be able to share my passion with, uh, about uh, viruses uh, in, in general and, and explore it in your, in your fu uh, future research um, as well. All right, so, um, so, so again, uh, um, today's talk is really covering viruses and, and, and how the viruses may interact with, with cancer. And, you know, many people might not know that there are a lot of connections between viruses and cancer. So, so uh, and, uh, and I'll talk to you about how viruses may interact with cancer in both positive uh, and negative ways today. And hopefully we'll have some time to answer uh, some of your questions. So, uh, so we'll start with the very basics. Um, uh, what are viruses? So, so, so viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. So, so they cannot survive outside of the cell. They really require cellular machinery for, uh, for replication. Viruses may come in many different flavors. The, the genetic uh, material may contain either uh, DNA or RNA. Uh, they are very genetically diverse, but, but they're much simpler than any cell that they infect. In fact, they are much smaller than any cell that they may infect. And, and shown here is an example of, uh, of how does the virus size compare to a cell size. And you can see that uh, uh, here's, here's just basically like an average uh, cartoon of a cell. You have a virus uh, shown here, which would be uh, one of the bigger viruses that exists, which is a herpes virus. And this is uh, approximately 200 nanometers uh, in diameter, and then you have smaller viruses like polioviruses, which are significantly smaller. But of course, you know, even with these biggest viruses, they're vastly uh, overshadowed by the, by, the over, uh, by the size and the complexity of the cell that they can infect. Again, viruses are many, and, and in fact, many of uh, each of the viruses is very unique, and it can exhibit very unique biology, and this is in turn uh, can dictate the host that they infect and also which tissue within the host that can infect and then uh, how, how pathogenic it will be. So, so shown here on this slide is the, is the general classification that we have for viruses. Uh, those are just the main uh, virus families that we have uh, and specifically focusing on vertebrates uh, or, or humans and, 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 uh, and other animals. And you can see the viruses are basically primarily classified uh, on the basis of the type of genetic material uh, that they carry and how does that genetic material 
uh, replicate. So, so we can have viruses that only have DNA, and, and these can be subdivided into categories of a single-stranded DNA viruses and double-stranded DNA viruses. We can have viruses that are pri uh, primarily carry RNA as their genetic material, but then in the process of replication in the host cell, they may generate uh, DNA as, as an inter intermediary step. And then we have viruses that are completely um, uh, RNA-based and, uh, and, uh, and they replicate the RNA uh, within the host cell, again, just sort of by generating a copy of that RNA and then incorporating it into the viral progeny. And even within this RNA category, you can have viruses that carry a positive strand RNA, which means it's an RNA that by itself can already be uh, uh, trans uh, translated to uh, to form proteins, and then there, um, there are double-stranded RNA viruses, and then negative-strand RNA viruses, which first need to make a copy of the RNA to be able to transcribe, uh, or, or rather translate uh, proteins. And, and again, these are just sort of major virus families that we have, uh, but then even within each family, you have numerous different viruses that can affect humans, uh, animals, uh, 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 humans and other animals. All right, so here's a typical virus replication cycle. I, I, I have put here an example of just an RNA virus, but, uh, but most of the viruses follow um, uh, the same principle. So, so the viruses come into the cell, they typically interact with some type of a cellular uh, receptor that's, um, that's uh, the primary step by which uh, uh, the specificity of the virus for the specific tissue is determined. And then the viruses can fuse with the cell, and then uh, sometimes it happens at the cell membrane. Sometimes the viruses kind of get um, uh, sort of engulfed by the cell, and the fusion can happen on a, uh, on a, in, in inside of the cell. But then this leads to the release of the viral genomic material. In this case, this is the viral RNA, and the RNA then goes on to uh, to either be transcribed uh, into messenger RNAs that express multiple viral genes or to be a copy to generate copies of, uh, of itself, uh, or meaning like the, the actual genome. And then uh, these uh, transcribed messenger RNAs then uh, are used to translate viral proteins. And then in combination with this uh, genome, uh, they get again assembled at the viral membrane. Uh, the viruses bud from the membrane, generate a fresh virus particle, and this process repeats itself. And, and the, um, this cartoon is an oversimplification, but you know, once you produce mo uh, new virus copies, they, uh, they tend to go on and, and replay uh, and in fact, neighboring cells. Um, obviously, this, this process does not go unchecked, uh, and uh, both the cells uh, and actually whole organisms have evolved strategies to fight the infection to stop it from, um, from propagating. So in the process of this uh, transcription um, uh, of the viral genes, um, the viruses do activate a number of cellular pathways, uh, and many of these pathways are specifically designed to recognize these foreign uh, viral genetic material. And one such pathway here is, um, uh, that's demonstrated in this um, uh, cartoon is this uh, RIGI MDA5 pathway, which recognizes viral RNA, and then uh, through, a, through a signal transduction cascade leads to production of a, of a specific protein uh, called, uh, or a group of proteins rather, called type one interference. And, and, these, um, and these type one interference are cytokines that get secreted from this uh, infected cell. And, and the purpose of the type one interference is to really to alert, first of all, the infected cell, but also neighboring cells that have not yet been infected, that, that there is an infection going on. And, and these cytokines bind special receptor on the surface of, um, of, of the cells called type 1 interferon receptor. And this further initiates a signaling cascade that, um, uh, that tells the cell that, in an, that there is an infection going on and, the cell, and allows the cell to shut down the processes that are typically required for viral replication, such as um, uh, translation. And this is really uh, what is known as an innate antiviral immune response. And I will come back to this in the future because cancers utilize the same pathways uh, or the cells can utilize the same pathways rather to fight uh, cancer as well. And many of the cancers actually have dysregulated type one interference signaling. So why do we study viruses? Uh, well, viruses are everywhere. 
Uh, in fact, the, the biomass on our planet uh, of bacterial viruses alone, not even accounting for mammalian or, or other eukaryotic viruses, it, uh, the, the biomass of these viruses alone exceeds that of all uh, Earth's elephants by more than a thousand fold. If we take all of the bacteriophage particles, uh, these are bacterial viruses from the world's oceans, uh, which, uh, uh, their overall number approximates 10 to the power of 30. And then, so if you put them back to back next to each other, they will extend out into space for 200 million light years. Uh, to comparison, our sun is only 0 0.000015 million light years away. So this is, so there are a lot of viruses out there. Uh, viruses are not just everywhere around us, viruses are actually in us. So a large portion of the human genome is actually constituted by endogenous retrovirus, uh, re retroviruses that got integrated into our genomes at some point during the evolution. Uh, about 5 to 8% of the human genome is actually um, containing viral sequences. And, and by comparison, only 1% of the human genome actually codes for known, known proteins that make up, makes us as, as we are. Average human body contains 10 to the 13 cells, but these are outnumbered by bacteria by approximately tenfold, and by viruses, again, most of these viruses are bacterial viruses, by as much as a hundredfold. So we are actually more viruses than we are humans. Uh, of course, viruses can, can cause human disease, uh, 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 which is another reason to study them, probably the main reason to study them. They can be beneficial. We can use viruses to design vaccines. We can use them for cancer therapy, as I will discuss later, and they can be used as laboratory tools. And of course, viruses can cross species boundaries, such as influenza, Ebola, or, or COVID-19. And this is yet another reason that we need to really understand uh, everything we can about viruses, and then not just human viruses, but viruses from other species as well. Viruses have also shaped the course of human evolution. Um, for example, as I mentioned, some viruses can introduce their genes in and mutations into the host genomes and then become integrated uh, as what happened in the course of evolution of humans and perhaps uh, every single other organism. Um, viruses can cause evolution in the form of adaptation. Um, like, for example, we're doing this meeting via Zoom due to COVID-19. COVID-19 has caused this type of evolution for us to adapt. Uh, 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 but, the, you know, before, before Zoom or thousands and thousands of years ago, you know, viruses, you know, pe people did not have Zoom. So, uh, so viruses, um, vi major virus infections often led to major migrations. Sometimes it's due to the disease that the humans have actually experienced. But sometimes it could also be due to the destruction of food sources. Again, viruses don't just infect humans, they can infect the, uh, the, the animals and even plants the humans consume. So, so destruction of these food sources could, uh, could occasionally lead to major human migrations. And then some viruses may have caused massive extinctions. And, and then there is a theory that uh, why the, um, uh, uh, that the viruses have actually caused the Neanderthals to become uh, extinct. And, and this is actually a very uh, sort of an interesting vignette that I have in here. You can, you can basically see on this timeline in here the co-evolution of, uh, of viruses, including human viruses, over, over, over this projected timeline in here, as well as uh, uh, evolution of humans, no, uh, noticed here as an AMH, or evolution of Neanderthals. Um, and you can see that the, both Neanderthals and uh, modern humans have coexisted over a period of a pretty long period of time. And on the map in here, you can really see that the, over thousands of years, the humans and Neanderthals have actually interacted. And it's, it's not really clear why Neanderthals have become extinct. The original thought was that the humans you know, but, uh, have exterminated the Neanderthals, but, but it is more likely that something more drastic has actually led to, um, uh, to, 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 to their uh, elimination. And in fact, there are studies that, um, that have demonstrated that the humans um, uh, and the human and Neanderthal interaction had led to a lot of interbreeding and a, a big portion of our 
DNA, well, not a big portion, maybe one to 2% of our DNA is actually coming from, uh, from Neanderthals. And this is a study now from a couple of years ago that have focused on these DNA regions uh, in humans that have come from Neanderthals. And it's interesting that the, the, the regions of our genome that we have adapted from Neanderthals, most of them actually are enriched for the genes that are encoding virus interacting proteins, meaning that somehow uh, uh, the, there was an evolutionary selection for the genes that we have acquired uh, from Neanderthals to persist. And this, this basically suggested that somehow um, 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 uh, there is a positive selection process that, that went on for these, um, uh, for these genomic sequences. And this was brought up once again, you know, about a month ago, that um, uh, and th this group of scientists had actually looked at uh, whether any uh, sequences in the human DNA can predict whether a human is more or less likely to get sick from COVID-19. And the interesting uh, thing that they have found is that this region of the DNA on chromosome three that, that, that's particularly enriched in, uh, in, the, in the patients that are more likely to have severe disease. And this is precisely the region that, uh, that, that we have acquired from, from the Neanderthals. Again, uh, once again, uh, sort of highlighting, again, not proving it, but at least pointing out to the fact that uh, perhaps something uh, in, the, in the natural evolution of the humans uh, that led to the perhaps acquisition of these genes to protect us from some viruses, but maybe make us more susceptible to others. So uh, viruses in our lives, uh, how do we experience it on a day-to-day -day basis? So of course, uh, uh, as you well know, vi some viruses can, uh, can cause acute infections. Uh, seasonally, these are typically common cold, uh, such as rhinovirus, adenoviruses, coronaviruses, influenza. Many of them are preventable they, uh, and can be eradicated through vaccination, such as polio, measles, mumps, rubella, smallpox. Many are geographically restricted but can spread, such as Ebola, uh, dengue, Zika, and West Nile. Some viruses uh, cause uh, acute infections that they can turn chronic, such as hepatitis B, C, and HIV. Some viruses can cause acute infections, but then stay in your body dormant to reemerge later, such as most of these viruses in the herpes virus family. Some viruses can integrate into human genomes, such as HIV. Some viruses can be used as laboratory tools. We will frequently use viruses to genetically modify our cells or even modify, uh, modify mice. Some viruses change what we eat, like, such as genetically engineered plants have been uh, often modified by using viruses. And what we're primarily going to talk about today is the, the fact that some viruses are known to cause cancer. And then some viruses can be used to treat human diseases, such as viruses that can be used to treat cancer. And that's the connection between viruses and cancer. So how can viruses cause cancer? There are several different mechanisms that have been identified. Uh, some of those mechanisms are direct. So uh, as I mentioned, some of the viruses through the course of human evolution have integrated into the human genome. While the viruses with, uh, that are acutely infecting humans, they can integrate into the host genome as, and dysregulate the gene expression, which may cause cell proliferation. Some of the viruses may encode uh, an oncogene, which can uh, stimulate cell growth and prevent cell death. Uh, other viruses can just cause mutations, deletions, recombinations, or other types of transpositions in the DNA, which can also modify the DNA structure and, and lead to, uh, to cancer. Some viruses don't cause mutations, but may cause um, alterations on the epigenetic uh, level, and again, dysregulate gene expression, allowing the cancer to form. And some uh, viruses cause cancer indirectly. And some chronic infections, like such as, for example, hepatitis B and C, may cause chronic inflammation in the tissue, and this may eventually lead to cancer. So uh, here's a brief history on oncogenic virus discovery. So, uh, and, and, uh, and in this slide, I'll primarily uh, cover retroviruses. So these are RNA viruses, such as HIV, that uh, once they infect the human cell, they first reverse transcribe their genome from RNA to DNA, and then this DNA gets integrated into the host uh, DNA. So, so in 1908, Ellerman and Bang have basically discovered that um, 
uh, that uh, a certain type of leukemia could be transmitted among birds. So they would take the, the, ex, uh, the blood extracts from the birds, pass them through the filter where you know, the cells would get stuck and everything else would go through, and they would transfer it to other birds. And they would see that these birds would, arrive, uh, would get cancer. So, uh, so this first suggested that you know, cancer could be uh, infectious. And then in 1911, uh, a gentleman by the name of Peyton uh, Rouse, actually working at Rockefeller University, has demonstrated that this, uh, uh, similarly that filterable sarcoma material could also induce cancer in birds. And later, uh, this virus was isolated and, and termed the uh, Rouse sarcoma virus. And, and for these discoveries demonstrating that the um, uh, that uh, viruses can cause cancer. Peyton Rouse was uh, awarded a Nobel Prize uh, approximately 50 years later. In 1936, um, uh, John Bittner found that milk factor that induced cancer in mice was later found to be caused by mouse mammary tumor virus, also another retrovirus. And then, uh, but these are all animal viruses, not from humans, but in 1979, a first human retrovirus called HTLV-1, uh, which is a cause of a rare type of adult T-cell leukemia, was first discovered by Robert Gallo at the NIH. Again, not just RNA viruses can cause um, cancers, DNA viruses can do that as well. Uh, in 1933, Dr. Richard Shope uh, isolated papillomavirus from rabbit uh, tumors. Uh, in 1960s, uh, a, a different type of a family virus called simian virus 40, which is a polyomavirus, uh, was isolated from monkey cells. Actually, these monkey cells were used to, uh, to grow uh, a human polio vaccine, and there was a concern that human polio vaccines were contaminated with this virus that uh, could potentially cause cancer in humans. Um, it has never really been confirmed whether this SV40 virus causes uh, cancer in monkeys or humans, but it has been a, a sort of a subject of ongoing debate for now many years. Uh, in 1966, uh, Epstein-Barr virus, or EBV, has been uh, of, uh, found to cause a, a, a certain type of Burkitt lymphoma. And then in 1983, Dr. Harold Zorhausen proved that human papillomavirus uh, causes cervical cancer. And, 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 um, uh, and because this is such a common cancer and, um, uh, and, the, uh, and, and the etiology of the cancer can really uh, help us to, uh, to, to cure this disease or even help us with its treatments. So Dr. Zorhausen was actually also awarded a Nobel Prize back in 2008 for, the, for his discovery. And then more recently in 1994 and in 2008, Dr. Moore and Dr. Chang initially isolated the Kaposi sarcoma associated herpes virus. Uh, this is very common actually in patients with HIV AIDS. And in 2008, the, the two of them again isolated this novel uh, polyomavirus called Merkel cell polyomavirus, which is associated with a rare type of uh, cancer called Merkel cell carcinoma. Uh, here's the general summary of the human cancers and the viruses that, uh, that they cause. Uh, again, so uh, human papillomaviruses can cause cervical cancer and head and neck cancer. Hepatitis B and C viruses can cause liver cancer. This HTLV1, as I mentioned, can cause uh, adult T cell leukemia uh, and lymphoma. We we'll have two herpes viruses that can, uh, well, one herpes virus known as HHV8 or KSHV, which can cause Kaposi sarcoma. This is the Merkel cell polyomavirus that I covered before, and Epstein Barr virus, which is. Um, Again, uh, a cause of the infectious mononucleosis, but has been associated with cancers such as African Burkitt lymphoma, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, and uh, a, a type of lymphoma called post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease, which is occasionally seen in patients that have received transplant. So we'll, we'll, uh, I'll cover the, some of the viruses a little bit more in more detail, specifically and I'll focusing on on how do uh, retroviruses cause cancer. And, and, and this is actually, it's, it's an important topic because uh, much of what we know about uh, cancer today has actually originally uh, been derived from the work on the oncogenic retroviruses. So, uh, uh, so retroviruses are RNA viruses. Again, the genome is really made up of uh, uh, RNA. Um, once the viruses infect the cell, the genome gets, uh, reverse transcribed into the DNA, and this DNA 
then gets integrated into the host uh, genome. And then once it's integrated, basically the viral sequences persist there forever. Uh, so this, is, this has now become a part of the host genome. This is one of the reasons why such a large portion of our DNA is actually made up of these uh, historical or prehistoric uh, retroviruses. So, uh, and then these uh, sort of, uh, this DNA now then is used as a template to transcribe fresh copies of the viral RNAs and, and to produce fresh viruses. And, uh, you know, once the RNA is made, uh, it's, it's, it's in turn used to transcribe viral proteins and these package the viruses at the membrane and, and, uh, and, and lead to production of fresh virus particles. And this, this is what happens with the uh, most common human retrovirus, which is HIV. Now, uh, um, uh, over, over the period of the past uh, 60 to 70 years, it has become recognized that uh, retroviruses um, can, can be associated with formation of cancer. And in fact, uh, these three gentlemen here, uh, David Baltimore, Renato Delbeco, and, uh, and Dr. Howard Temin have, um, have earned a Nobel Prize for, uh, for their work demonstrating how uh, infection of the cells with retroviruses can lead to formation of cancer. Dr. Dolbeko actually did not do as much work on uh, retroviruses as he did on uh, polyomaviruses, but a lot of his discoveries have led to the, to the subsequent work by Dr. Baltimore and Dr. Temin uh, to make these uh, discoveries. So how do retroviruses cause cancer? Um, uh, but it has been now demonstrated that uh, retroviruses in their genome can actually carry oncogenes that they capture from the infected cells. And, um, um, and here's a, a, a diagram that basically demonstrates of how the viruses can capture oncogenes uh, from the cells. And I'm not gonna go through the diagram in great detail, uh, except with the exception of saying that uh, you can have a simple retrovirus that basically integrates into the host DNA uh, at a site that may be close to the, to the cellular oncogene or a cellular gene that's, that's um, not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, uh, car carcinogenic at, at the time, but it's, it's the gene when mutated or dysregulated may lead to, uh, to overall cellular proliferation. And here, here are some of the examples uh, of su such genes. Many of them are uh, some type of growth factor receptors or could be even uh, part of the essential signaling pathway within the cell. So, so when this virus becomes integrated by, by two different mechanisms, when, uh, when the viral genome is uh, transcribed, uh, a part of this oncogene can become captured into the virus particle. And then, um, so once you form the fresh uh, virus, it basically now carries uh, not just the viral uh, RNA within it, but it can actually carry a copy of this oncogene. And you can imagine now that if you take this virus, uh, which is carrying this oncogene and then infect a new cell, once it's integrating, it is with it introducing a part, uh, that oncogene into the newly infected cell. Now this oncogene, again, which signals for the cells to proliferate is now dysregulated because it's really only transcribed by the viral promoter as opposed to the being regulated by, by the intricate cellular machinery. And in this way, a virus infection can cause cancer. Um, and it has been shown, uh, in fact, that many of these uh, mammalian retroviruses, uh, that, that some of which I have mentioned in the previous slides, can carry these oncogenes. And in fact, here, here's a listing of uh, both avian uh, retroviruses and mammalian transducing retroviruses and the structure of their genomes. So, so you can see that many of these viruses, such as here's a rouse sarcoma virus that I mentioned before, which carries an oncogene called SARC. Uh, there, 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 there are some other viruses, like for example, this abelson murine leukemia viruses, which, call, which carries an, an oncogene, a protein, a protein a kinase actually called um, ABL, and, and there are many, many others. So, uh, and, and again, these sort of got incorporated into the viral genomes in the course of evolution of the viruses infecting the human cells, or rather not human cells, but any mammalian cells, and then picking up this, uh, this oncogene with them. And, and, and as I mentioned, many of the human 
uh, known oncogenes have actually been initially discovered in retroviruses, such as RAS, which is a very commonly human mutated oncogene. Its homolog was initially discovered in rat sarcoma virus, or SARC, uh, um, uh, which is um, uh, also uh, a known human oncogene. Its homolog was initially discovered uh, in RAS sarcoma viruses shown here. And in fact, for this discovery, Dr. Michael Bishop and Dr. Harold Varmus uh, shared the Nobel Prize uh, in, in 1989. Um, besides carrying the oncogenes, both retroviruses and oncogenic DNA viruses may have other mechanisms by which they can uh, transform uh, cells. So some viruses can encode uh, oncogenic homologs of human genes. Some viruses can actually integrate neo-human oncogenes and just dysregulate uh, the expression uh, uh, of, of these proteins. Some viruses may themselves encode proteins that alter cellular signaling. Uh, and then some viruses can disrupt cell cycle control that can allow the cells to proliferate continuously, uh, such as some of the proteins uh, encoded by adenoviruses or, or HPV. And some viruses can inhibit apoptosis, which can allow the cells to to survive despite the virus infection, such as the adenovirus E1B protein, or again, HPV E6 protein, which both block P53. And, and this is just a little vignette on the human papillomaviruses and, uh, and, and, and how, um, how important uh, um, uh, it is both um, uh, economically and, uh, and health-wise for the, for the world population. Uh, there are uh, over, uh, at least 51 subtypes of the human papillomaviruses that have been identified. Um, um, most commonly, they cause benign tumors such as warts. But then there's some subtypes, most commonly HPV 16 and 18, which are associated with the majority of the world cases of cervical and head and neck cancer. And this is actually a huge health burden for the world population. And, and so vaccination against HPV, which, which is now available, is actually very highly effective in preventing infection with the virus. And it could potentially prevent over 90% of the HPV-associated cancers. What does that mean numbers-wise? Globally, this would account to prevention of approximately 570,000 cancers in women and 60,000 can 60, cancers in men annually. And this could also prevent over uh, 300,000 deaths annually. So, so clearly there's a huge burden of HPV associated cancers around the world. And as you can see by this map, it is you know, due to the screening and vaccination, fortunately this burden is becoming less and less in the developed countries, but it's still unfortunately a huge, um, uh, 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 both economic uh, and health concern for, for, uh, for some of the developing countries. So uh, therefore measures to, uh, to incorporate vaccination in these countries could significantly reduce the mortality on e or even development of a cancer in the first place. Uh, lastly, I wanna cover hepatitis B and C viruses. These are um, uh, uh, viruses that normally cause uh, both acute and chronic infections uh, in the liver. The viruses themselves are not entirely uh, oncogenic, but, they, uh, but due to the chronic um, uh, infection in the liver, they cause uh, a, you know, continuous death of the hepatocytes, which is uh, uh, liver cells. Uh, and then as the liver cells die, the new cells proliferate to replace them. And the continuous proliferation of these liver cells increases the likelihood that some types of mutations will be uh, introduced. Uh, and then moreover, because you have chronic infection that's going on in the liver, uh, the uh, uh, and, uh, and the chronic infection generates inflammation. So the production of free radicals and superoxides due to this inflammation can further lead to the DNA damage. With, with hepatitis B specifically, there's been some evidence of integrated hepatitis B DNA into the host DNA, which, which may suggest that some of the mechanisms of oncogenesis with this virus may also be related to, uh, to, to altering of signaling pathways within the cancer cells. But, but overall, both of the viruses uh, uh, cause cancers by very similar mechanisms, which is chronic inflammation. Now that I've covered all of the bad viruses, I just want to highlight that not all viruses, including integrating viruses, are bad. Uh, and in fact, uh, some of this portion of the human geno genome that's, that's made up of the viral sequences, uh, carrying the viral sequences which are functional. 
and uh, and uh, and this is just a graph that demonstrates that uh, that we you know some of these viruses viral sequences are, are evolutionarily selected for meaning there is a reason that our genome has kept them for for many of these sequences we still really don't understand why would the human genome carry these uh, sort of what we would call garbage sequences in, in other worlds, but, but perhaps um, uh, these sequences actually have a function. But we know that at least some of them do carry a function. An example of this is this, um, is this protein called syncytion. And, and syncytion is basically expressed, uh, um, uh, is incorporated into the human genome from uh, a human um, uh, endogenous retrovirus, but, it, but it's actually expressed. And when is this expressed? So it's expressed during pregnancy. It, is a, it, is be, it used to be a viral fusion protein, but during, uh, during pregnancy, this fusion protein becomes upregulated and it's actually playing a role in the formation of syncytial trophoblast, which is, which is an essential part of the placenta. So there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's part of the placenta that has a sort of both human, uh, human, they're all human, both the fetal and the mother portion, and the, and and part of the a part of these cells are actually fused together through the formation of this uh, through the expression of this sensation protein, and it's it, this is an essential process that kind of uh, keeps the 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 child isolated from the mother and and prevents the immune system of the mother from attacking uh, attacking the child. So this is uh, this is one example of how the uh, the, the, the human genome has actually co-opted the viruses to help them. And then there are other examples where viral promoter elements that have been um, integrated into the human genome, and actually the, those help to regulate production of some of the uh, hormones. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, some of these uh, endogenous retroviral sequences can actually be served as, as a guardians of the human genome, even within the context of the cancer. And it has been shown that uh, some of these endogenous retroviral sequences can be upregulated during the cancer or certain types of therapy. And, and of course, remember what I, what I mentioned, these viral sequences can be recognized as foreign by the human uh, endogenous uh, uh, innate immune, re uh, immune uh, response and alert the cell that something wrong is going on, which may in, in turn alert, uh, alert the immune system to kill that cell. So, so I'm going to switch gears now and talk about viruses, cancer therapy, and my personal academic path and how, how did I become interested in viruses and why am I talking to you about viruses today uh, in, in this cancer seminar. So I'm going to um, uh, start a little bit about myself and how I ended up specifically studying viruses and cancer. So it's, uh, it started actually pretty early in my age that I became interested uh, in viruses. I, I grew up in Uzbekistan, and, but at the age of nine, I contracted a, a very severe infection with varicella zoster virus. It's, it's a cause of chicken pox, but when, uh, when you get it when you're older, in, in this case, uh, a bit, you know, older than the age of five or six, it can become pretty severe. So I had encephalitis from it, which means infection of the brain, which put me in bed for basically over 30 days. And I, it, it, was, it was pretty bad, so I had to learn how to walk again. But this first got me interested in viruses. Uh, a few years later, I moved to the US, but had no clear career goals at the time. So uh, I worked at a car wash, helping my parents settle in the new uh, environment. I, I studied at Manhattan College in the Bronx. I was a biology major. I had some interest in biology. Um, so again, worked part-time jobs uh, at night to cover uh, living expenses during college. But then uh, a few years later, I came as a summer student uh, to Dr. Peter Palazzi's laboratory at Mount Sinai. This is uh, Dr. Palazzi. He's still there. He's the chair of microbiology department there. He's studying influenza viruses uh, and their pathogenesis. And this is where I really uh, sort of got my hands wet with the laboratory research. I learned how to clone influenza virus genes, culture cells, and develop uh, basically methods for genetic engineering of these viruses. And, and, and this is where I settled on a career of a, of a scientist. So, so in year 2000, I joined Mount Sinai School of Medicine, MD, PhD program. And after going through uh, multiple laboratories, I went back actually to Dr. Palazzi's laboratory and stayed there as a PhD student, where uh, for my thesis work, I studied mechanisms of influenza virus induced apoptosis. 
Um, uh, because of my interest in viruses, I went back to medical school after getting my PhD and uh, thought about getting a career in infectious diseases. But once I started my clinical rotations in the, uh, 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 on, on the wards, I really did not like the infectious disease field from the clinical perspective. And I thought it was not for me. But during these clinical rotations, I also encountered a very inspiring patient who had metastatic melanoma. She had no therapeutic options at that point. So I, uh, that I started doing research, um, uh, or sort of more like literature research, um, uh, and, and came across several trials from 1970s, which used this strange virus called Newcastle disease virus for, for melanoma with, with significant success. So, um, uh, and, and this first got me interested in the field of uh, how can viruses be used to actually treat uh, cancer. And, 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 and what I discovered at that point is that the idea was not new and it actually predates the use of chemotherapy or radiation therapy. In fact, uh, it starts with the 1800s when the people have no, noticed that sometimes patients had natural tumor regressions, which have coincided with, um, uh, up to, uh, with human infections. Uh, in the 1890s, William Coley started using strep pyogenes to, to treat head and neck cancer. Uh, and then over the next sort of uh, 100 years, there have been multiple experimentation with various human and animal viruses, uh, which have demonstrated um, a different degree of success. And eventually this has culminated in 2015 with a virus called TVAC being approved for advanced melanoma. Uh, this is how oncolytic viruses were initially thought to work. Uh, the viruses would be infused into the patients. The, uh, the thought was that the, because the viruses do have predilection to particularly replicate in cancer cells while sparing normal cells, that the, the virus would replicate, uh, amplify its own copies, and then spread to other cells. And then again, these cancer cells would become infected, generate more copies of the virus, and so on and so forth, until the virus is gone and the tumor is gone. But now we know that this is not the primary mechanism by which these viruses work. Uh, what actually happens is that the viruses do generate a significant inflammatory response with an in influx of a lot of immune cells, which is probably, probably, probably the main mechanism by which the viruses can eliminate uh, cancers. So, so many viruses are naturally what we call oncolytic, but some of them can be modified for therapeutic purposes. Again, if we take many of the wild type viruses, may, uh, they can be uh, uh, potentially pathogenic in humans, but uh, the viruses can be genetically modified and attenuated and then further engineered or armed to express additional proteins that can aid uh, with, uh, with their therapy. Again, going back to this strange virus that I have encountered, it's called Newcastle disease virus or NDV. It's an RNA virus. It's in the family of Paramyxa viridae, same as mumps, measles, and rubella, but it doesn't infect humans normally. It's natural host as birds, and in fact, it can actually cause significant um, uh, bird disease. Uh, but again, in humans, it doesn't cause disease, but it seems to infect human cancer cells very well, just because many of the human cancer cells have deficiency in these innate immune signaling uh, responses. So, um, so, so back when I was in medical school, I had some elective time. So in 2007, I actually connected with uh, Dr. Yuman Fong, who used to work here at MSKCC. And Dr. Yuman Fong, as, as this picture shows, is a very energetic guy, open to many different ideas. He was interested in oncolytic viruses. So, so I actually took an oncolytic virus from, from a laboratory that I worked, uh, uh, worked in before uh, in uh, Dr. Palazzi's laboratory, brought it to Dr. Fong's laboratory. We genetically engineered some of these viruses and made several models that actually worked pretty well in melanoma. And here's an example of such a study where, where if you infect uh, a cancer cell with this, uh, with this now, this is a fusogenic form of the virus, which allows for the fusion between the different infected cancer cells. You can see that uh, these engineered viruses can cause, this is just a, in a cell culture, can cause significant spread of the virus amongst the different um, uh, cancer cells, which is much better than the wild type naturally occurring virus. And this worked very well in mice. And this, in this case, this is an, an example of a pleural mesothelioma, which is a type of cancer that grows in the chest cavity. It's, it's tagged with luciferase. When we inject uh, these mice with the virus, we can co completely er eradicate these cancers. 
this is an example of a, of a mouse model with a, with a gastric cancer where, where we can completely eliminate gastric tumors uh, from the peritoneal cavity as well. Uh, so uh, moving on with my car uh, career, I, uh, I went into internal medicine uh, residency at Mount Sinai Hospital, but continued my work in oncolytic MDV. And over this time, I got a growing appreciation of the role of the immune system underlying the efficacy of oncolytic viruses. So I came back to MSKCC as a fellow in medical oncology, where I joined the laboratory of Dr. Jim Allison here, where we focused on mechanisms of anti-tumor immunity stimulated by oncolytic viruses. Now, several years later, Dr. Jim Allison moved to MD Anderson and, um, when, when, and, and subsequently won a Nobel Prize for, uh, for his discoveries in the field of uh, uh, cancer immunotherapy. But I continued my work here at MSKCC under the mentorship of Dr. Jeff Bolchak. And since, since 2014, I have been a faculty at MSK in gynecologic medical oncology where I'm continuing research in oncolytic viruses, both in the laboratory and clinic. Uh, I know we don't have that much time remaining, but maybe I'll spend just a few minutes talking about our current uh, research, and then I'll, I'll, I'll leave the rest of the time to ask uh, some of the questions that you may have. So uh, I'm going to skip this slide, but I'm, what I'm going to show you is that um, uh, how, how do we... Did, so some of the discoveries that were made in, in the mechanism of action of how these oncolytic viruses work. So, so for these, we use these animal models where we implant tumors into mice and then we treat them intratumorally with, with one of the oncolytic viruses that, that, that we have. And what we notice uh, when, whenever we treat our mice is that these, anim, uh, these again, the virus doesn't spread very well across the different tumor sites. So we can see that the virus replication is really primarily restricted to this injected uh, tumor, but these tumors become very inflamed. They get a lot of T cells uh, into them. And when we look at the distant tumor, even without getting the virus into the distant tumor, we can see that these tumors also get a significant numbers of tumor infiltrating uh, T cells uh, into them. And it is well known that these T cells can actually play a strong role in the immunotherapy response. So, 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 so again, to, to summarize this mechanism of action, the oncolytic viruses don't just lyse cancer cells, they make them significantly more immunogenic. And as the virus infects a cancer cell, it can release a lot of, first of all, tumor antigens, which are recognized by the cancer cells. Uh, it can directly activate some of these antigen presenting cells, which can activate uh, T cells and other parts of the immune response. But also there are a number of cytokines and type one interferons, which, which again, uh, normally are suppressed by the cancer cells, but now become released and alert the immune system that something is happening. And then in the process of trying to clear the virus, the immune system actually starts recognizing the cancer cells uh, as well. Uh, there are a lot of negative feedback mechanisms that get upregulated by this. Part of it is immune checkpoints, which are negative regulators of the immune response. I don't know if you have attended the previous lecture on the cancer immunotherapy, but these, uh, these negative immune regulators, are, uh, which block T cells from functioning, they can be further blocked by antibodies targeting uh, uh, molecules like here, CTLA-4 or PD-1, and they can restore the T cell function. So in our models, when we use these kinds of strategies now and combine our intratumoral NDV therapy with systemic therapy blocking these immune checkpoints, we can completely eradicate the cancers that are both either injected by the virus, and not just the, vi the, the cancers that are directly injected by the virus, but even the cancers that are present at the distant site, because by being able to induce this tumor-specific immune response, we're able to activate these T cells to fight the cancers both uh, that are directly injected with the virus and the cancers that are present at other sites. And this has now been confirmed in some of the early clinical trials. This is not with our virus, but with a different virus, showing that, um, that this, uh, you know, that, that an infusion of these immune checkpoints with just an intratumoral treatment with the virus can, can uh, induce tumor regressions, actually, in the majority uh, of the mice. And, and we're utilizing the strategies for therapy of ovarian cancer. This is the cancer that I commonly treat. It's a horrible cancer. It usually presents at a very advanced stage where the people come in with the swollen abdomens with, uh, filled with lots of fluid called ascites. And surgically, if you look at what's going on in their abdomen, it's basically everything is covered 
by these um, uh, tumor nodules, making it basically impossible for the surgeon to completely uh, to remove. So by using animal models, we can demonstrate um, that uh, even in these peritoneal models, when we give uh, oncolytic virus therapy, we can significantly induce uh, infiltration of these immune cells. So, so what we're doing now is we're running clinical trials where we, where we give the patients intraperitoneal uh, viruses and combining it now with the systemic immune checkpoint inhibitors to see whether this kind of a strategy can be helpful for treatment of human cancers as well. So lastly, I'm going to conclude by summarizing some of the things I've presented to you. Uh, we are surrounded by many viruses and there are many different kinds of viruses. Uh, they have altered and probably defined the course of human evolution or maybe even evolution of every animal that we know or every animal that we don't even know. The viruses can teach us about various aspects of human biology, including cancer. Viruses can cause many human diseases, including some cancers. And also that viruses can be used as tools, uh, uh, laboratory tools, but, or, or even therapeutic tools, such as therapeutic tools for cancer. And again, my, uh, I just want to give you a few words of advice, perhaps, just because my career path in oncology has not been typical for many people who, who, who start out uh, uh, being interested in a cancer therapy. But, uh, but, but I think you should be open-minded uh, about many different areas and learn about many different fields and don't be afraid to challenge the dogma, but the broader uh, knowledge you have about the different fields, uh, perhaps even outside of your field of study, the more you can contribute to your own field. Uh, you need to know your learning style. You need to learn to function independently, uh, but also know when you need to ask for help. Sometimes you could be the only expert in a specific field even within your laboratory, but always know that there's somewhere, someone out there that, that can help you. And, and the key probably for, 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 for being successful is really finding the right mentor at each step of your training who will be able, to, first of all, to guide you, in, 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 uh, for, guide you and also support you in any of the interests you may have. And with this, I'm going to stop and we'll be happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Zamarin, um, for the talk. We do have a couple of questions. The first is from Osvaldo Pena. They ask, how do they know the Neanderthal extension is caused by a virus? Sure, absolutely. Not exactly in the field of cancer therapy. So, so they don't know that the Neanderthal extinction has been caused by viruses. There are obviously many, so, uh, many speculations that are... Um, that are out there. I mean, the, the, the leading theory in the field has been is that the humans, as they have spread, they have actually eliminated the Neanderthals. But the, tim the timelines don't exactly match uh, of, uh, you know, the human spread and the Neanderthal uh, extinction. And again, from this, some of this circumstantial evidence by looking at the genetic sequencing, I think that it's, it's still a theory, basically, whether whether some kind of a major infectious event has caused this, but the, but of course you know it, it is not a proof, and I think the more sequencing we get from uh, viruses and Neanderthals, I think the, the better uh, we'll be able to answer these questions. Okay, great. Um, we do have a question from an anonymous attendee. They ask, why do certain viruses cause cancer in certain parts of the body, um, like how um, HPV leads to cervical head and neck cancer? Sure, absolutely. So, so that for HPV specifically, the answer is, is relatively simple. It's basically the first route of exposure. The viruses get transmitted from humans to humans. So, uh, uh, and the HPV infects epithelial cells that are lining the cervix or the oropharyngeal uh, mucosa. And since these are the first cells that the HPV encounters, these are the cells that it will uh, infect. Uh, and, in the, and, that's, and those are the cells that will proliferate and, um, you know, become cancers. Some, some, uh, some viruses that get transmitted by other means that, um, you know, like, for, for example, through blood are more likely to cause cancer in, in, in these organs. So, so hepatitis B or hepatitis C, for example, are usually primarily blood-based transmission, or they can be transmitted by sexual route as well. But again, the point is that they eventually go through the blood and they have a predilection 
for infection of uh, of liver cells, and uh, so you need so so to be to cause cancer in a specific tissue. So number one, it's it's where the tissue uh, is exposed to the virus, but number two is does your tissue have the specific receptor or ability to uh, to replicate that virus? Okay, great, thank you. Joel Lee asks, what are the measures taken to stop oncolytic viruses if by chance they contribute to the rise of invasive cells? Um, so, um, so, so maybe the question, so uh, the, the question, if the question is about oncolytic viruses, meaning, um, um, the, uh, there's a question, um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll reinterpret the question. So it's basically mm -hmm. what if the oncolytic virus by itself becomes infectious and can kill a person? Uh, like maybe that's the easier way to, to put it because obviously these, these viruses, while attenuated and have predilection for cancer cells, they can actually, you know, cause human infections. So there are different measures that can be done. So number one, that viruses can be modified to, uh, to be only uh, infecting cancer cells where they have a specific receptor, but not normal cells. But the, the main modification is usually, again, that the viruses are only able to replicate in cells that have deficient innate immune responses, which is primarily cancer cells. Normal cells usually have a robust uh, innate immune response. In fact, if I throw an, an, an oncolytic virus onto a, 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 onto a cell culture with the normal cells versus uh, tumor cells, or even have one tumor cell and like millions of normal cells, it's only that tumor cell that will be, be infected just because uh, it's very early on in the infection process that the normal cells basically stop the virus from replicating. Okay, great, thank you. Siru Pu asks, how far are we from the point where researchers can tailor viruses to specifically target receptors on specific tumors? Uh, it's an excellent question that I wish I had the specific, uh, like the answer to. There is so much about the oncolytic viruses that we don't uh, understand still. And I think, uh, you know, the previous research was really trying to direct towards uh, having a virus specifically infecting only uh, a specific cancer cell on the basis of the receptor. But we know that many of these receptors are also expressed by many of the normal cells. So there are other mechanisms to to try to tailor the virus uh, replication to specifically to the cancers. And now with the recognition with our recent findings that it's not necessarily the virus replication in the cancer cells that's important, but it's how well does the virus induce uh, your uh, immune response against that specific uh, cancer cell, meaning that how well does the virus teach the immune system to recognize that cancer cell as cancers? That's probably going to be the primary mechanism by which uh, by uh, by which we're going to try to tailor these types of therapies to become more immunotherapy-like rather than oncolytic uh, per se. Okay, great. So we've gotten a couple of questions. Um in reference to your professional path, specifically your career and choosing a mentor. Could you speak a bit more about um, how did you go about choosing your mentor and the importance of mentorship through your um, career progression, not only as a physician scientist, but in your college level, your medical training and so forth? Yep. So, so sometimes things just kind of uh, fall in place, right? And then uh, you may you may uh, discover a person that that uh, that actually has a passion for a certain uh, field of research, and then you will learn to share uh, share their passion. In my case, I guess it was a little bit different because I almost had my own passion, and then I just sort of uh, looked for a person who would have a, a tangential interest, but at the same time would uh, you know would be, would become um, no pun intended uh, intended infected by my passion. So it's uh, so this is where. Uh, 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 I think that's that's how my career path has uh, has progressed. Uh, and the, the the best way to find out about a mentor a lot of time. Well, first of all, you need to you know you need to experience you know the, uh, have some experience with them. So this is why in graduate school or uh, uh, you know what they allow you to to rotate, for example, through multiple laboratories to see what your relationship with the mentor would be like. But you also need to know your own uh, learning style. I know that there are some mentors that. That, that you know just constantly watch you and are breathing breathing down your neck as opposed to mentors that uh, that completely delegate to you and uh, give you freedom to do whatever you want so, so knowing what you are comfortable with and what your mentor is comfortable with is important when establishing that kind of a relationship 
um, in the end, asking people who have trained in the laboratory was probably the most uh, important uh, thing for me when choosing a specific mentor, because a lot of times it's not just their mentorship in um, in the specific subject that you're studying. Because a lot of it, a lot of the information you can you can get from uh, from the web uh, or from talking to your to your immediate colleagues. A lot of it stems actually whether this is a, is not just mentorship but sponsorship. Is that does this person have your career interests in mind meaning is this the person that at that crucial time of need are they going to be the one that's that are going to pick up that phone call that important one important phone call that you need and are they going to make that phone call and as you're deciding on your mentor in the future you kind of need to ask yourself that question that is this going to be the person that's going to make that important phone call for me or not Okay, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Zamarin, um, for your talk. I'm just going to share my screen before we close for a couple of announcements. So the first, we have two lectures um, this week, tomorrow with Dr. Bayan on stem cells in development and disease. And on Thursday, August 6th, Dr. Sanchez Vega will be speaking on computational analysis of biological information. So we welcome you all to join us for the two remaining seminars this week, and we'll be sending reminders about next week's seminars. Um, and again, we will be sending you a feedback survey, as well as if you have additional questions, Dr. Samarin has welcome to answer them via Twitter, and we will share his Twitter information as well. Thank you all for your time, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you again, Dr. Samarin. Sure, absolutely.